for an, another incredible webinar. Today we are being joined by Sheikh Walid Bisyuni, our Vice President here at Al-Maghrib and the instructor of the famous Fiqh of Love course that you guys have been hearing about. Um, Jazakallah khair to those of you who joined us this Tuesday for our Midlife Marriage Crisis webinar with Sheikh Abu Isa Niamatullah and for the many of you who have connected with us since and joined and loved the course since then. Please start saying your salams. Let us know in the chat where you're coming in from um, as we start today's live stream. Today we're talking talking about incredible marriages from Islamic history and the lessons that we can learn from them. And we can't wait to start the conversation with you all. Uh, Aisha, I recognize your name, mashallah, for one of the first people to always comment. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah for being here first and for your big salam coming in from the UK. Zishan, assalamu alaikum. Where are you coming in from? Let us know. I see that you guys are zooming in. Again, salam as well to those who are coming in from Sheikh Walid's page. Lama, I see you. Wa alaikum as coming in from Cochrane, Alberta. Um, Raghad coming in from somewhere in Florida, um, uh, Zishan as well. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. And again, those of you who are coming in, let us know, Let it, uh, give us a quick salam and, and, and fill in your location in the chat there so that we can shout you out. Also, don't forget to share this uh, this live stream, inshallah, in your group chats, put it into your Facebook messenger chats, your WhatsApp, Telegram now, uh, and make sure that you spread uh, the love, inshallah, so that others can also benefit from this topic. I feel like there's not enough celebration about romance and love in a all manner in Islam. So we want to encourage that, increase that in the community as well. Um, I see someone coming in from Nigeria, mashallah. Another person in the UK, London, Jazakallah khair, UK people always staying up late. Last session was at 10 p.m. This is 9 p.m. Uh, British Standard Time. Jazakallah khair for making time for us. Someone else coming in, Munira from Nigeria. Jazakallah khair for joining. I think it's about the same time in Nigeria right now. Bangladesh in the house. Where are the Canadians? I need to know, where are the Canadians? I see some Americans. I see some people in the UK. I need some, actually, sorry, Lama. Lama is a Canadian. Um, but do, let's let's get some representation going. Share it so that we see more of you guys. Tanya coming in from LA. Um, Isata coming in from Netherlands. Jazakallah khair and welcome, welcome, welcome to today's live webinar. Now, as I've mentioned before, these webinars and this entire series is sponsored by the Fic of Love, which is um, an amazing uh, online course that has been brought to the community by a Mulgrub Institute. We're super excited to bring it to you guys in an online format. This has been one of our most famous on-site courses for a couple of decades now. And Alhamdulillah, Sheikh Walid has been teaching it, perfecting it, finalizing it. And it is now 20 hours of content, 100 lessons, all on the right decisions to make in every step of your journey uh, when it comes to finding love, when it comes to finding uh, a partner for life, whether you're in the very early stages, whether you're just thinking about it, preparing yourself, trying to find the right person, and trying to do the right thing in engagement and marriage situations, and then starting to build a life together. And then whether you're, you know, a middle-aged couple going, having established a long-term uh, marriage and trying to keep it healthy, trying to keep it alive, whether you're someone struggling with divorce, uh, whether you're a widow, etc., we cover all facets of this uh, kind of experience. And alhamdulillah, we've had so many of you guys join us. But today, we wanted to give you guys an open session, give you a chance to interact with Sheikh Walid, ask questions at the end of the session as well. And I don't want to take any more time away. I see people, more people coming in from the UK, still no more Canadian. <laughs> but Nigeria and UK are representing very heavy uh, in the stream. Kurdistan as well. Welcome to all of you. Jazakallah khair. And without further ado, I want to uh, bring on Sheikh Walid Basuni, our Vice President at Amagrib Institute. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Sheikh, how are you doing today? Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ahlan wa sahlan. Ahlan wa sahlan. Welcome, welcome to Fiqh of Love. And finally, I am uh, so eager to go live on this class, actually. I have been. Uh, waiting for the opportunity to meet you guys online. I've been uh, watching the people who are just in the class and the Telegram chat and get to know some of the brothers and sisters who register for the class, okay. um, their feedback, their expectations. And uh, I'm glad that we were able to share with you guys these uh, sessions. And I'm very grateful, thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, first and foremost, mm -hmm. for making this possible to be connected to so many Beautiful, beautiful people from around the world, from Nigeria to Netherlands to Kurdistan to one person from Canada. <laughs> and <laughs> two, two, okay. two, 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 sorry, <laughs> two. Okay, and uh, LA, you know, to Houston, to Calgary. Okay, <laughs> Lama, I, I can't. Calgary, mashallah, I'm badana, mashallah. Anyway, equal to seven. Um, uh, Ireland, mashallah. And this is my first time to have a student from Kurdistan. 
even Masha. though I have some students from Kurdistan long time ago, uh, Florida, from Florida to LA, that's incredible. You know, mashallah. Uh, this is a great blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us able to connect this way and to share uh, the khair and the knowledge and the experience that we have. Uh, in relation to a very important topic, talk about marriage. Um, and uh, I would like also to extend my thank to always to our sister, Sister Hafsa, Zala Khair, for uh, being a, a, a leading force yani, in, in making this happen. Uh, and all the people who are behind the scene. And I'll absolutely, uh, my thanks and uh, my love and my appreciation to uh, my colleague, my best friend, Sheikh Abu Isa Ni'matullah, Jazallah uh, Khair, for the wonderful webinar that he gave uh, uh, right before this one um, a few days back. And if you missed that uh, webinar, I highly recommend you to uh, listen to it. You know, uh, when they talked to me about middle, middle life crisis or midlife crisis, I said, that's Abu Isa, you know. Not because he has been like crisis, no, because that's that's where he can be real, you know, these real things. And he, he doesn't, he just give it the way it is very raw, very organic, very pure, mashallah, jazallah khair. You know, uh, for me, midlife crisis is the one that appeared in your middle, <laughs> you know. <laughs> anyway, so uh, let's go back to the topic. Um, Today, I would like to explore with you um, a little bit about history uh, and, and explore the life, the personal life of people inside their homes, in their relationship with their uh, spouses, and how marital relationship was in the life of people who we uh, love, respect, consider role model for us so we can learn from them. And, uh, you know, it is so easy to fight for one's principles uh, than to live up to them. It's easy to have good principles in life, but what's really hard is to, love, is to live up to these principles. Many people claim a great principle, but their reality is far away from these principles that they claim that they uh, believe in. And the best way is to find out that those people really live up to these principles or not are by looking at their life, their relationships, especially with their family. That's why the Prophet Sallallahu said, uh, don't show me, and it's the Sunan Tirmidhi and other, don't show me any, uh, uh, your good manners, okay? Um, here and, and, and just display them in public and the masjid. Uh, only, or, or that's that's not what going to make us judge you as a good person. He said, The best among you when it comes to mannerism are those who are the best of their family. Because at your home, the real you comes out, how you are, who you, are, who you really are. Um, nobody is perfect, you know, I, I understand that. But uh, these principles, if you're really an honest person, if you're a a truthful person, if you're a decent uh, uh, person, if you are generous person, if you are respectful person, if you are trustworthy person, that will appear first and foremost in your house before it appear uh, uh, with public. If you're a happy person, you'll see that at your home before you'll see it outside. And um, that's why in Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's life, uh, and Sirah, it was well documented, and that's why the Prophet ﷺ also one of the reasons that Ulama said he married multiple women, and these women that were witnesses over his life, وسلم, telling us about how great he was. And I can't start talking about the life of some great individuals that we see their life as a role model for us without starting with the Prophet Sallallahu's life and comment on his life sallallahu alaihi wasallam because that were the role model and the nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam is a role model for us as a husband as he was a role model for us as an imam in the salah as an as as a one who making hajj the one who practicing the religion his role model in all aspects laqad kana lakum fi rasulillah uswatun hasana in rasul sallam a role model for you a good model to copy and to follow 
And as Ibn al-Qayyim, Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, said, it is sad that you see people trying to copy the Prophet ﷺ and to follow the way of the Prophet ﷺ when it comes to salah and hajj and ibadat, and, but they don't follow him when it comes to aqidah, uh, belief, uh, how to view God, how to understand uh, faith, and also in suluk, in, in behavior, in uh, the area of uh, spirituality. And I'll say today, unfortunately, people will start seeking guidance uh, from other than the Prophet ﷺ's uh, life, when it comes to relationships, especially with your family. We start looking into movies, soap operas, uh, uh, literatures, uh, uh, poetries, you know, uh, and all these things can help, you know, uh, counselors, uh, uh, books, psychology, books are written in, in, in human psychology. All these are excellent, no problem. But what is shame, is that you have also an, an excellent role model for you right there in front of you and you don't benefit from it, you know, and you don't follow it. The best of guidance, the best way to live your life, that's what hadi, that's what sunda means, the way to live your life is hadi Rasulullah sallallahu is the hadi, the way of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And, uh, before I start with sharing some of these examples uh, um, in the next 25 minutes or so, I, I want us to think about the nature of the relationship between the husband and wife. Because I do believe recognizing this nature of the relation, the nature of this relationship, <coughs> of this aqd, of this contract, of this connection between you and your wife, it will affect the way you live your life and the way you deal with your spouse. And so many times we forget about that. We kind of, you know, uh, we forget what is what connect us together. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and this is an amazing verse. Allah says in the Quran, وَكَيْفَ تَأْخُذُونَهُ وَقَدْ أَفْضَى بَعْضُكُمْ إِلَىٰ بَعْضُ وَأَخَذْنَ مِنْكُمْ مِيثَاقًا غَلِيظًا Ya Salaam. In Surah An-Nisa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, and how could you take it back, yani the dowry, after having enjoined each other intimately, and she has taken from you a firm commitment. A firm commitment. مِيثَاقًا غَلِيظًا Or you can say, uh, solemn, uh, uh, covenant مِثَاقًا غليظة. it's so firm it is so solemn it is so strong and in this this phrase مِثَاقًا غليظة, solemn covenant or a firm commitment came in the Quran three times one of them to define the relationship between the husband and wife and the second one in Surah Al Ahzab, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said, "Wa id akhadna min al Nabiin mithaqhum wa min ka wa min Nuh wa Ibrahim wa Musa wa Isa bin Maryam wa akhadna minhum mithaqan ghaliba liyasal al Sadiqin an Sadiqhim." We did take a solemn covenant from all of them, who? The prophets that Allah mentioned. And remember, when we took covenant from the prophets, as well as from you, Ya Muhammad, from Nuh, wa Ibrahim, wa Musa, wa Isa, who are these? These are Ulil Azm min Rusul, Muhammad. And Ibn Nuh and Ibrahim and Musa and Isa, they are the, the messengers of the strongest will, the top of the messengers. Allah have taken from them mithaqan ghalidha, a solemn covenant to do what? So the relationship between them and Allah in that covenant and that promise was ghalid, very firm that they will deliver the message and they will be patient with it and they will, will fulfill their obligation towards Allah and so forth. And the third one, for the children of Israel, Allah said, 
ورفعنا فوقهم الطور بميثاقهم وقلنا لهم ادخلوا الباب سجدا وقلنا لهم لا تعتدوا في السبت واخذنا منهم ميثاقا غليظا we have taken a firm covenant from the children of Israel this time you are not going to break your promise this time after all the incident knowing the history of Bani Israel with Musa alayhi salam and after Allah saved them from Fir'aun and all the things that happened in the desert okay and now the time they go into the Jerusalem and to enter the land of Palestine you know Allah took a covenant from them and that covenant was غليظ so can you imagine that this is the type of promise that made to each others between you and your spouse why because when you marry someone you don't just ask for her hand you basically taking over her heart and when a woman has given you her heart you can never yeah, and you get rid of the rest of her ah she gives you heart she gives you everything and the moment the man you're not just marrying the man you you basically became his partner part of everything you're not just marrying someone that you can live with now the relationship it become someone i can't live without someone that i call zawj pair someone that i can call partners sharik understanding that the nature of the relationship it really explained to us some of these beautiful stories and i want to tell you these stories and the life of of the scholars or the prophets of sallam the sahaba the companion not necessarily to be all you know in a perfect mood perfect no aisha radiyallahu anha she said wa kana rasul sallam rajulan min rijalikum he's like, he's a man like any other man sallallahu alaihi wasallam and another word he's like any man he would like any human being kana basharan min albashar he was like a, a human being so there is a time for him to be tired not in a mood to talk maybe he might sometimes get angry sometimes you know uh, uh, happy you know like normal thing that's why she said sometimes we fight and we don't talk to each other radiyallahu anha wa ardaha so here uh, uh, no doubt exploring and spending more time talking about the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam because that's the role model for us sallallahu alaihi wa alihi so we can learn from others as well but one of the thing that stands out for me so clear about the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's life with his wife that his love is so recognized that he loved his family he loved his wife they he expressed that in every way you can think of verbally by by saying it and not only to her to people you know what they call aisha radiyallahu anha for example they call her habibat rasulullah the love of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said about khadija in yurzuqtu hubbaha i have been giving her love i love her sallallahu alaihi wasallam about khadija and you know even when he was asked by one of the companions you know amr ibn as asked him ya rasulullah you know uh, who do you love the most he said aisha then who he said her father even at this point he doesn't want to yani uh, uh, make her not part of the conversation her father he still hang on her name he still wanted her to be part of the conversation he showed that aisha said he used to help at home i, I always read this hadith and I, I'm, i'm always like asking myself helping at home i mean aisha's house is what it's like a few meters uh 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 yeah i mean the width of it and another 12 meters maybe 12 meters by two, by 7 or 6 something like that it's very small it, it's it's a tiny it's a tiny house the whole entire house it's like 20 feet maybe by 12 or something like that 
It's like a big room we have today. That's her house. And guess what? For three months, she doesn't have any food to cook. What helping? Helping with what? Umar said, I walked to the Prophet's house. I couldn't find anything to see that I can look at. I'm like, so wow, this is like something. No, no furniture, is nothing. So what, what kind of help she needs? But it never was about the help. It never was about the need of help or lending hand. It's about showing the love in actions. He will help her. He will do sure with her. He will do this act of service, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Umm Salama tells us that he used to kiss his wife before he leaves to, to the masjid. How many times he goes to the masjid? Five times a day. Even if it doesn't happen every time, but you know, he, he would kiss her his wife and then he will leave to the masjid, sallallahu Showing that companion. Abu Kathir mentioned that one thing when he wants to go to sleep, he takes his shirts off. So his skin will touch Aisha's or his wife's skin. Nothing. Today, no. MashaAllah, you have your own blanket and you have your pajamas and you have your robe and you have, you know, and you like there is a pillow in the middle. <laughs> But he does that because that physical touch means something. In Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he sees Safiya when her camel broke down. She was worried she's not going to continue the journey. He, he, she was crying in tears. Then in Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam comes, كَفَّفَ بِيَدَيْكَ He wiped her tears with his hand. And embraced her, giving him the assurance give them nicknames, all these ways of showing his love to the Prophet Sallallahu to, to them. You know, when, when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, one of the beautiful incidents in his life Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the story behind the Surah Al-Tahreem, Ya ayuha nabiyu lima tuharrim ma ahalla Allahu lak. O Prophet, why do you make haram upon yourself what Allah have made halal? You're a role model. You cannot just say, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to eat that. Or this is forbidden me to do. Because if he did that, وسلم, people will take that as um, a, a form of legislation. He can't do that. But why did he do that anyway? Why? What did he do? And Nabi وسلم, said, Wallahi, I'm not going to eat honey anymore. Or I, he, he said, I will not eat honey. It's forbidden for me to eat honey anymore. Honey, we know the Prophet loves honey. We know that honey is a blessed uh, uh, food and mentioned in the Quran. And it's a healing. Why would the Prophet do that? Because in Nabi Sallallahu used to go to Zainab. And Zainab, radiallahu anha, she is a woman who used to work and to make money by making things and selling them, like some antiques and stuff like that. Also, you see here the Prophet marry a woman who works and she makes money. And so she wouldn't have money, she buy honey and it's expensive. She buys this because she knows the Prophet loves it. The other wives don't have that, so they felt jealous. So Aisha made this uh, uh, plot with, with Hafsa and others. When the Prophet comes from Sophia and come to your place, tell him, What's the smell? It smells like a, like a bad breath. You know, did you eat something or drink something bad at Zainab's house? No, just honey. Ah, it's not bad. Then Aisha did said the same thing. The Prophet ﷺ was, he said, Wallahi, I will not drink that again. Why? He gave up something that he loves just because this has bothered his wife because the smell of it. If somebody cared that much, about how his breath smell. What that tells us, when I know that my husband, this is something that bother him, or my wife, this is something that it will bother her. Oh, let her adjust herself. That's who I am. No, that's how, that wasn't how, that Prophet Sallam's reaction. You know, 
one of the great things about the Prophet ﷺ that he was a considerate person. And all these stories that you hear, they're very considerate. They think about the other, other people's feelings. Sometimes in marital relationship, we forget, the, we forget about the feelings. We focus on the issues, but we don't focus on the feelings that attach to the issues or around the issues. If I hurt somebody, I think about, you know, just the solution. Okay, let's do this. Yeah, but that's not the only thing. It's just let's do that or do this or change that or hire or buy this or sell that or move to this place. No, there is also feelings attached to these incidents and conflicts and, and, and distance. And these feelings, if, if we let, if we ignore it, it will grow and it will control and will become triggers and will control our behavior in the future. And Nabi Sassam was so careful about that. About, he's very considerate. He saw Salam understand how she feels. When the Prophet Sallallahu was traveling once and Aisha lost her necklace, he didn't just move and go. No. And Nabi Sallallahu have let the whole caravan to wait until they look for and start looking and searching for her necklace. Where is it? It means something to her. It means something to me. If your spouse thinks something important, it is important. And that's something I talk about in one of the things that when it comes to marriage best practices. And he stopped the whole caravan. And by the way, a lot of people don't know that. It happened twice, not, not one time. And that was a necklace that given to her by her mother. It means something to her. You know, when he heard a rumor, a whisper about Sophia, his wife, and you know Sophia, she is, she used to be a Jew, converted to Islam. Her father was a Jew, one of the Jewish leaders. And simply, oh, the Jew woman, the Jewish, the, uh, you know, kind of saying things which is not appropriate. She was feeling bad, feeling down. And then Nabi Sassam came to her and he said, don't worry, they're jealous of you. None of them like you. They're right. They, they were saying that you're not like us. We are Arabs with this. We, we're not Jews, you know, or pure Arab families. He said, none of them like you. You are the daughter of your grand grandfather is a prophet, Musa. And your great grand uncle Harun is a prophet. You descend from a children of Israel is filled with prophets and messengers. There is no one else has this many messengers. No tribe can claim that. No one descend from such great heritage like you. And guess what? You married to a prophet. The best woman can have in Quraysh or Arab. She is married to a prophet, but she cannot claim that her great father, uncle, and all of them were prophets like you. She was so happy. He didn't just say, don't listen to this silly stuff. No. In Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam um, was a gentleman. And, and, and there's many stories to show how gentle he was. For instance, he will not cut his wife off when she's talking. Even if she talks a lot, even if she keep going, he will just listen. And when we read in Sahih al-Bukhari, Bab Ishrat al-Nisa, how to live with your family with goodness, you'll see that he mentioned the hadith, the story of Umm Zara, which is long hadith. Story of 11 women gather and start talking about their husbands and what happened to them and what's their husbands doing and all this kind of stuff. I mean, the Prophet ﷺ have a time for that, but he was listening attentively and he was engaged in the conversation with Aisha. And in this webinar, I can't go to the details, but there's a lot of these things I mentioned in details in my course. 
and, and in other lectures. But the whole point is to raise awareness. Uh, Ashia, I'm glad that you joined too. To what I'm, what I was saying, is that um, well, I don't know if it's just from my end. I think we may have lost Sheikh just briefly there. Let me just make sure that if you guys can let us know in the audience. Um, if you can see me and hear me, I think we've just lost Sheikh briefly, but he'll, I'm sure he'll reconnect uh, very quickly. So Jazakallah for your patience. And I think I see you coming back, Sheikh. Let us know when you can hear us and see us again. Um, as we're waiting, please feel free to submit your questions that you have for Sheikh Walid on the fiqh of love and on the topics and the stories that we've covered today. Um, and inshallah, we'll cover them near the end of this session, inshallah. Jazakallah khair to everyone who's letting me know that you can see me. It looks like you guys can't see the Sheikh. Uh, inshallah, we'll be back with him in just a minute. I see that he's still trying to get back into the session, inshallah. Um, so Jazakallah for bearing with us. Uh, the Fik of Love, the course that this entire experience is based on, um, is the most beautiful experience it covers. I know Sheikh Walid, mashallah, is a romantic uh, in, in the way that he describes, in the way that he shows uh, and he shares his stories. So if you want to hear more of that, if you want to hear more stories and definitely hear more guidance from him, I highly recommend you check out the link in the description um, and inshallah register for the course. It's only available for a short period of time and we are still starting the live Q&A sessions for, this, for the, the, the course itself next week. So you do not want to miss out. You want to be able to access some of the content beforehand. It is available for lifetime access. So you don't have to worry about going through the entire course if it's not a good time for you. But I see the Sheikh is back with us. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, nice. Welcome Wa alaikum back. Thank you. you know, I got to speak with the little title saying, presenting Dr. Walid Basuni, instructor of VP uh, of Al Maghrib. Does that look for coming back with us, Sheikh? I'll let you uh, continue where you were. Okay. Uh, so, what, what I was saying earlier, be sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is a very, is a gentleman, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Once, uh, when he married Safiya and uh, she wanted to ride her camel. The Prophet ﷺ put his, he goes down and let her put her feet on his thigh. Then she ride the camel to help her. In our modern days today, it's like you go and you pull the chair back. Tell me, I ask you, how many of you guys pull the chair back to his wife before she sit down in the restaurant? I mean, how many of you, your husband, do that? Uh, you know, how many of you guys, before they get into the car, they go and open the door for his wife? No, I'm going to tell you, it's yeah, not much. <laughs> okay? Uh, you know, I'm guilty of that sometimes. You know, they say when you see someone open the door for his wife to get into the car, you know, uh, the wife is new or the car is new. You know, <laughs> all of the two. But anyway, uh, uh, nice. I do 60%. I love you, Ibn Osman. How long have you been married? <laughs> I'm just kidding. But keep it up. You know, uh, but these little things shows how gentle man you are, how gentle woman you are. Nice. Soraya, I love it. Tell your husband that I'm proud of him. Ibn Osman, 13 years. Congratulations. That's that's the type of, uh, of, of, of husbands and, and wives we want. Okay? So even if he doesn't, it doesn't mean that he's not a good husband. Just don't misunderstand me. But these little things, he might do other things. Like, for example, the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Aisha, well, uh, see how gentle woman she is and how gentle man he is. She will, he will drink, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Actually, I need the drink, so I made up this example. So he drink from here, that's right. Then the process will give her the cup. She will turn the cup to the same exact spot and she will drink from the same spot. How romantic this is. But also it shows how gentle woman she is, how nice she is. These little things makes a difference. He was invited to eat at somebody's and that person known to make good uh, food and cook the meat in a special way. And he said, I'll bring my wife with me. That's, that's all about how 
attached he is. He feels the disconnection is so strong. He said, no, I don't invite women to my house. He said, I'm not coming. Many times I remember this, this hadith, okay? When I get invited to very nice hotels or like uh, food or, you know, um, it's so in interesting that you think about your, I wish that she's with me, eating with me now. Or you know what, let's go try this together. In Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when you look at his life, is so faithful, very faithful. And, he, and years after Khadija, he will not allow anyone, anyone to say a single word about her, which is not appropriate. Even Aisha, when she said something, was not appropriate, he was so angry and, and very firm in the way he reprimanded her. Aisha said, for a whole month, he was not happy with me, with what I said. And I said, Wallahi, I will never mention her again, ever in my life. When one person just made a gesture about one of his wife and her absence, that she's kind of shorty, you know? He was mad. He said, this word that you said about her, just she didn't even say a word. She did like this. Like she's a short woman, you know, too short for you. And she made a gesture of the hand. The process almost angry. She said, this thing that you said, this thing what you did, if you mix it with the ocean, it will turn, it will corrupt the ocean. That's haram, that's ghibah. So how can you allow your parents say all these bad things about your wife or your husband or your brothers or your sisters or your friends? Talk about your husband and you just either okay or even if even if if he is not a good person. I will not allow that. Being faithful. This is a mithaq and ghalidah, a firm covenant. There is the scholars had a problem between him and his wife. So they told him, he said, she's my wife. I can't talk bad about her. When he divorced her, they asked him. He said, now she's my sister in Islam. I cannot talk about her. That's a good advice, Al-Fudayl ibn Ayyad said. He said, give your, wife, give your daughter to someone who fears Allah. Because if he keeps her, he will fear Allah and treat her well. And if he divorces her or the marriage comes to an end, he will still fear Allah and he will be good to her. Because this didn't change. Zain al-Abideen had a problem. Let's explore more stories. Had a problem once with, with his wife. And things get so tense. He said, see, he loves her. He said, you know what? Whatever. I give you the right to divorce yourself if you want. If you want to divorce yourself, go ahead and divorce yourself. I give you that right. But me, I don't want and I cannot. And I cannot force you to stay in the marriage. So I give you the power to divorce yourself. She stayed for a little bit. Then she said, hmm. We've been married for 20 years or 10 years. I forgot right now. And for 10 years, you have that power in your hand and you never use it. And now you give it to me and I'm going to use it and abuse it in just in 10 seconds or 10 minutes. No, I give it back to you. I don't want. It. He understands that the, 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 the connection is strong. The tie is strong. And I think that what made people, you know, that what made people survive so many problems in marriages. And the more I read about successful relationship, it is always comes back to those who, who fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and watch Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also at the same times that they always feel that they are in the same team, in the same side, me and my wife, me and my husband. The moment we, we, he's in this side and I'm on this side, the moment the marriage fell apart. But no matter how, pro, how much problem we have, as long as we see that we're on the same team, the same side, 
we can work it out. And, you know, being also faithful, uh, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as I said, you know, one of the most beautiful stories I heard, uh, something that Imam al Jawzi rahimahullah uh, mentioned, that he said, Kamat Imra'a, uh, in his, uh, uh, يعني, he mentioned that one of the women, the early generation from Tabi'in, the successor, uh, she was actually uh, got some food they just collected barley from the farm okay what kind of tajin she was making bread and uh, making dough to making uh, bread and in the old days breads and, and and food is commodities that it is equal to money that's why when they used to buy something they buy it with bread they buy it with fruits you know with dates and stuff like that so while she's making the dough to make to to bake some some uh, bread i guess uh, in the house, she was told, she was told that her husband passed away. She said, Inna lillah wa inna ilayha raji'oon. And she said, okay. She told the kids, now, we cannot, or the servants and the people around her, hey, save this doll because we cannot use it. Now we have partners in it. Do you know what she mean by that? Since her husband passed away, that means there is inheritors. That means he might have a father who will inherit. He might have, you know, other wives she's going to inherit, uh, children that not of her, or, or uh, adult children, whatever it is the case. He said, now we have part. I have to make sure that I can't use this. Even just bur like, you know, some bread. And another story, he said, oil. Should that, because it has a value. We have to make sure that everybody gets a share. How faithful these are, women are. When Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, he married Fatima. Fatima was his dream woman. Yani Umar ibn Aziz, he used to say, I had dreams in life. One of my dreams to marry Fatima, the daughter of Al-Walid ibn Abdul Malik. Her father was the king, the Umayyad king. And he married her. And after he married her, he told her, so he became Khalifa, you can't keep all this gold and all these things that your father gave you, because I don't know if your father gave you this gold from halal or haram. You can keep it Islamically, but I take the higher standard in life. Then she took all the gold, put it in a box and put it in the Muslim's treasury. After he died, her brother became the king. And when he saw that gold and it's sealed like, this is my sister's gold. And he took that box and the chest where all this jewelry worth millions and millions. And he brought it back to her. She said, no, I would never let it in my house. Take it out. He said, why? Then she told him what happened. He said, but he passed away. He didn't want this type of life for himself. But not necessarily you. You know what she said? She said, "Ma kuntu li utiyahu hayyan wa asihi mayita." I'm not this kind of woman who will obey her husband while he's alive, and fulfill his wish while he's alive, and he I will go against his will after he dies, or after he died. Take it out of my house. You know, when you read, you know. Some of these like incredible um, stories about the Sahaba and the relationship with their wife, how how they have this connection, and one that's what I said. One of the things that save marriages is there is a bigger goal in life. So many times we get caught into this dunya that our relationship is only about money and house and kids and education, but we forget that there is something even bigger than that. That I married my wife because she complete half of my deen. I marry my husband because I complete half of my deen by marrying my husband. I'm marrying him because that means us together can walk faster to Allah, can go farther in Jannah and higher in Jannah together than being by myself. Talha bin Ubaidillah, 
a rich man, very rich. And he became extremely rich at one point of his life. And he used to give some of it. One time, he received money from Hadramaut, a trade that he did. And it was 700,000 dirham. If you transfer this to money today, you talk about any, something like equal to $20 million, something like that. That's a lot of money. And at that night, he, he couldn't go to sleep as if something stung him. Then his wife said, what's wrong with you? You don't look normal. Are you, wh what is it? Then he said, I'm so worried. She said, about what? She said, I received that amount of money. You don't worry about what? A thief comes to take it? What is he going to do with that? No. His wife, Umm Kulthum, Who's Abu Kuthum? She's the daughter of Abu, ba Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. She said, what, what do you worry about? He said, I have all this money in my house. And I know that there are so many Muslims in cities and neighbors and some neighborhoods and, 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 and relatives and friends, distance ones or close. They don't have anything and they don't have much. Then she said, hey, Let's count who among your friends needs help and your family. And our neighbors. And after Fajr, both, they start dividing this money that came from Hadramah and they distribute most of it before Dhuhr. They said, There's not a house from the Muhajirin Ansar unless they get something. That's the kind of relationship. Work together. That's something beautiful about you and your spouse. Make sure that there is something you invest in the deen between you and your spouse. You work in maybe volunteering together in a masjid or in a, uh, 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 some uh, social uh, uh, work that you do together. I remember Imam Siraj Wahaj when his daughter got married. You know what her mahar was? Her honeymoon, sorry. Her honeymoon was her and her husband, they went and they volunteered in an orphanage in Africa, some African country. And they spent a month there helping and offering service. She's in her father's footsteps. Abdullah bin Mas'ud was married to a woman, her name is Zainab. And Zainab, she was a very rich woman. You know? And, 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 and uh, very rich, has a lot of money. And she used to give a lot of sarah. But guess what? Because at that time, Ibn Mas'ud was not working, and he has children from previous marriage. So she used to give all her money, spend her money on her husband and her house, and she doesn't have much money to give. So one time she heard the Prophet saying, Ya ma'ashar al-nisa, Woman, I, I encourage you to give charity. She came back to the woman and she said, you know what? I used to give money. I knew a man who don't make much money. He didn't have much money. I now have to spend most of my money on, you, on your children. And nothing left to give in, in charity. What should I do? What, what do you think? Is the money that I spend on you and your children, is charity? Or it's not, should I give some outside? Why didn't you ask the Prophet ﷺ? Then Ibn Mas'ud smart. He said, no, you ask him. So she said, I took one of the women from Ansar and we went to the Prophet ﷺ. And we at the door. And I said to the person at the door, I have something, I, I have a question for the Prophet. She said, The Prophet, when you see him, you have so much respect that you don't just dare to talk like this. She's a, a sister, she's shy. Then she said, I was I was like 
shy to speak to him directly. So Bilal came out and he, he said, what do you want? He said, we have a question for the Prophet and we'll tell you the question you ask the Prophet. So we'd, we're scared to ask him directly, kind of. And she said, is a sadaqah, charity, can be given to husband and to his, to my husband's orphans, because Ibn Mas'ud has kids, their mom passed away. So is it considered charity, sadaqah? But please don't tell him who we are. She doesn't want to embarrass her husband. She doesn't embarrass herself because she knows Mas'ud close to the Prophet. How, how, how thoughtful this is. Sometimes sister comes to me to ask me about something, questions, small questions about something. She tell me the history of her husband from day one until today. Fadahit al-Rajjan scheme. Like I get to know so much about his life. I said, many times, I said, Khalas, I don't need all these details. Bilal came inside and he said, Ya Rasulullah, these two women asking this question. The first one, who they are. I, Bilal has to say, he said, this is a woman from Ansar and Zainab. Bilal smart. He can't lie, he can't say no. So he said, Zainab, and there are so many Zainab. But then Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam insisted, and he said, I use the Sayyanib, which Zainab? He said, I have to say it. You know, we're trying to please both sides. He said, Zainab, the, the wife of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. He said, tell her, you have two rewards. The reward of charity and the reward of taking care of your, the closest person to you, which is your husband and his children. Ajrul Qarabi wa Ajrul Salaqa. So this, you know, working together, it's interesting. You know, Hafsa, the Prophet's wife, uh, 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 I know Hafsa, I want to make a comment. This is, I mentioned Hafsa, the Prophet's wife. She will, let me finish it. She, will, she will let me finish it. <laughs> Hafsa, uh, before she married to the Prophet, she knows how to write, and she was a good writer. She knows how to write. And she was taught by a woman, her name is Shifa al-Adawiyya. So maybe someone he married Hafsa and he said, you know how to write and to read. And you know, there's very few women have this talent at that time. She said, yes. And, and this woman taught me. Then he said, call her and work with her so she can teach you how to perfect your writing. As she taught you how to write. You know, when I read that, in Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi himself was not a writer. He doesn't know how to write. Is that is that shame that my wife has more education than me? Is that a bad thing to empower my wife to finish her education and to learn and to? Aish said, "Rahim Allah, Nisa Al Ansar." Their hayat never stopped them from learning the deen. I mean, I, I can just go on and on. There's many many examples actually I had, and that this lecture made me think about exploring this topic even more. You know, yes, we might not have a detailed information about families, but we have a little bit. Riyah, and, and that's to re-emphasize what I said earlier about the issue of you and your spouse work together towards Allah. That bring you so close to each other. Riyah ibn Amr al-Qaisi married this woman and he wanted to test her see how she is and she's testing him too how how the relationship with Allah is when the night came she stopped praying in the early night and he said okay she prayed in the beginning of the night and then she got to sleep after one fourth of the night she called him she said Yariyah, why don't you stand up and pray with me then he said no I'm tired she prayed she rested she prayed again then she woke up, she'd come. Now two fourths of the night done, half of the night. She said, I'm still tired. Then at the last fourth of the night, she woke him up again. 
Let's pray something before the Fajr comes. She said, I'm not sure I'm tired. I'm just going to wake up for Fajr. Then she said, Man gharrani bika ya riyah. Who deceived me and told me that you are a righteous, avid worshiper? But he told her later, I just want to see what's your habit of prayer. You know, um, I, I heard about like one of the ulama, rahimahullah, he said in his first night, you know, his wife told him that I want to read for you Surah Al-Baqarah. This may be too much of a yani, high example, but or, or, or yani, um, it's not a, a role model to copy, but the idea to get. She recited for him Surah Al-Baqarah, the, the, the whole Surah Al-Baqarah. And actually she wrote that her ijazah in Surah Al-Baqarah came from her husband in the first day of their marriage. Because they used to marry in the daytime. Not like us in the night time. The whole Surah Al-Baqarah. You know, there is a great Imam, his name Ibn Abdul Hadi, died 900 uh, uh, Hijri, 909. He's a student of Taymiyyah. I found a book that he wrote, or I found about a book he wrote, and I started reading it a little bit uh, in it. It's interesting. It's called لَقْتُ السُّمْبُلْ فِي أَخْبَارِ بُلْبُلْ لَقْتُ السُّمْبُلْ فِي أَخْبَارِ بُلْبُلْ Talk about the... Talk about Bulbul. Bulbul? Bulbul also, it's the name of a, of a bird. But I found out Bulbul is the name of his wife. So he wrote a book about his wife. And... He says in this book, she died with a plague. Let's say somebody like your wife or her spouse died in the COVID, so you write some journey about her. He did the same thing. And he said she died 883. He died 909. So you can say he lived about 20 years or so, 25 years after her Sharda. He said, I lived with her 10 years. And he spoke a lot about, about her. Okay, I said she was a free woman to do whatever she wants, but she always loved to stay home with me. And in this book, he talked about the, the bird bulbul, and if there is any hadith came mentioned the word bulbul or not, uh, and so forth. It, it was very interesting actually to see that. Then I found out that he's not the only one who said that. Actually, many scholars wrote biography about their own wives. And about this process. Safra, Safra. She's the wife of Taqiyuddin al Maqrizi. Died 845 around the same time. He lived in the same era of Ibn Taymiyyah as well. He wrote for her a biography in Tarajim al Ayan, in his book about the biography of the well known, respected people of Islam. And he talked about his, when he married her, when they did the contract, the marriage, the, the consummation of the marriage, uh, how, when he, his first child was born, you know, the, the like, then he said that he divorced her uh, 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 in, in, in such and such year, but he said, I'm remarried her again. And he said that I felt so upset that why after a fight, that we get a fight, then we, I divorce her. Then he said, I, I was felt so bad. And I, even in my dream, I saw this dream and I saw this person telling me that because of the so much love somebody have given you evil eye or something like give you hasad and, and break your marriage. I wish that we'd go back to the way we are. And I decided to do that. Then he went and he he said, I I, uh, I, I couldn't imagine. Okay. Uh, then I, I married her again and we had a child uh, together, but she only lived two years after we married again and, and she died, rahimahullah ta'ala. No, she got sick, sorry. And when she got sick, I was so sick for her sickness. I saw in his dream 
you know, like he's crying over her, over her body while she's sick. She, I know that she will die. And he said, I woke up that morning and she died, actually. Uh, and he said, I used to make istighfar for her so much every day. And that's all the benefit of marrying a righteous person. He making istighfar for her all the time, in every salah, in the middle of the night, in the end of the night. And one time I saw her my dream. And I saw her in the same way I, I laid her in her, in her, in her kefen, the clothes that you were wearing, the last time I saw her. And I, 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 I look at her and I said, are you dead, Umm Muhammad? She said, yes. Then he said, what I send you every night and every day, does it reach you? He means the stighfar that he, then he said, yes. Every day your gifts reach me. Then she tried crying. I said, why are you crying, sweetheart? She said, because you know where I am at right now, I can pay you back. I can re-gift, uh, I can give you another gift in return. She was so nice in life. When he does something good to her, she makes something good to him in return. He said, no, I can't do this anymore because I'm in a different world. And he told her, don't worry about that. Soon we will meet. Soon we'll be together. He said, she was young, but wallahi, she was the best woman that I ever heard of, ever known, I ever met. Even though in their marriages, there were a divorce and separations and remarry. But look, and she was trustworthy. She was so balanced. She was so mature, Rosanna. No one can ever replace her. And he said in the end, may Allah gather me with her in Jannah and forgive me and forgive her. You know, there are so many you know, things I can go on and on about how this woman with the ulama share. And that's a good point to end with. One thing I notice about the scholars and their spouses, that they, sh they were supporting them or the scholar supporting the woman who's a scholar. There is a level of support and complimenting and inspiring to grow together. Fatima Samarqandiya, she used to give fatwa when she married Imam Al-Kasani, rahimahullah. He let her continue to give fatwa and they write the fatwa and they will sign it together. And when he makes mistakes in his class, she used to correct him and tell him later on, this is wrong. He used to send to ask, what do you think? And she would correct him. She was mastering the madhab of Abu Hanif, rahimahullah. And he wrote this beautiful book, Bada'a as -Sana'a. One judge in Losha, his wife was more scholar than any scholars in their, in their neighborhood. And when he heard about her beauty and her, 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 her manners, her, her, her uh, knowledge, he married her. You guys, if you read about him, he used to sit as a judge in the court. And he would bring I know it looks like we may have lost the Sheikh's audio really briefly. So give us one second, inshallah, just like last time. Uh, he will be back with us in just a minute. Uh, just a little uh, care to those who've been sitting. He, he will be oh, in, 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 in his court. It'll be like some room or usually they do this in the master. And when question comes and, and hard question comes and issues comes, you know, he will say, hold on. And he leans and he looks at the door and he said, what do you think? And she will tell him and he will judge based on her recommendation. That's why one of the scholars wrote to him. He said, in Lausha, a city called Lausha, a judge who has a zawja, a wife. And <laughs> he said, I wish, you know, her, her ruling goes over people because she judged between people. I wish that he was not a judge and I wish she was the judge. Al-Qadiyah also means, Yani, to destroy you. 
And when the judge showed his to his wife, she wrote, she said, give me the paper. What a strong woman. Give me the paper. And she wrote on the papers another two lines in the same rhyme, the same exactly way format of the first one. Then, you know, uh, uh, if you don't stop, I will put you in jail for insulting the judge. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, I, I, and I will end here. I'll stop here because uh, there is so many uh, or so much to be said about uh, the scholars, rahimahullah ta'ala. But uh, yani, uh, there are so many great people that we are in so much debt to their knowledge, to their contributions. Like Imam Shafi'i, rahimahullah. Like Imam Rabi'at al-Ra'i. Rabi'at al-Ra'i, hada, he is the one who taught Malik the fiqh. And Imam Malik himself, okay? Uh, uh, and Imam al-Awza'i, rahimahullah. Those people have contributed so much to the deen. Do you know what those people, what the common factor between these individuals and others? They were raised by a single mother who their husbands died. And that's the, something I talk about in my class. The single mom. They, they were taught their first lessons by their mothers. Took good care of them, raised them, taught them, took them to best teachers, best school, as we say today. Worked so hard. So if you're in theory as well, so if you're in theory, my, my, my mom used to work. Work hard to support me financially. Shafi, the same thing. Malik, the same thing. Give beautiful advice. Go study with Rabia, Malik's mom said, and learn from his adab before his knowledge. Rabia Rai, his father, disappeared 30 years. 30 years he was taken in a war, and they thought he's dead. And after 30 years, he came back. And after he, he saw this young man in his house, his wife was pregnant. And he thought his wife married someone else and conflict. And the, the son saw this man coming inside the house where his mom is. And they start like about to fight. But like, and mom said, no, 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 this is your father. And after things settled down, like usually happen, the husband said, Hey, by the way, when I left, I left with you about 30,000 pieces of gold. What happened to the money? What did you do with the money? Did you still have any of it? Did you spend all of it? What, what happened? So I'll tell you what happened. Just take a nap, I'll tell you. She took him to the masjid of the Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he saw this huge gathering. Among the students of Imam Malik, rahimahullah, and other يعني, great scholars. Okay? And uh, uh, waiting. And all of a sudden, this young man comes. He's 30. And walk and sit on the chair. And everybody with the book listening to him, learning from him. He looked carefully. He's the same man that he saw in his house. That was his son. That was Rabia. And she told her husband, that way. What do you think? He said, that's the best way to invest your money. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us marital relationship that help us to set our priority in marriage straight to come closer to each other so we come closer together to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to inspire us to move forward towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while we are so close with our spouse you know the best things is having a spouse it helps you to go farther very far than what you ever can do on your own or by yourself I say sometimes, yes, I agree. Sometimes when you are on your own, you can go faster. But when you have your spouse, you can go farther. If that spouse is on the same side, the same team.
Thank you very much. Thank you so much for these beautiful stories and gems. I, I know cannot hear you, Hafsa. Can you guys hear me? I think you should be able to hear me right now. Sheikh, can you... Let's let's see in the chat. You can let me know in the chat if there's any issues with the audio. On my side, it looks like it's clear and it's showing green. How so? Are you there? Yes. Let's can you hear me? One second. You guys, let us know in chat. Okay. Can, so you. can hear me. But you need to be able to hear me, Sheikh. So let's see um, if there's anything that we can switch up. Uh, check the volume. I'm just messaging the Sheikh so that he can uh, possibly see it on the screen there, inshallah. Uh, this entire experience, this session was of course sponsored by the, the course Fiqh of Love on online. I do highly encourage if you guys benefited from some of this. I know Sheikh Walid has a, a magic, a style of, of teaching and of, of, of sharing stories, mashallah, with us uh, that is unforgettable and it, it completely changes your perspective as a listener. So if you benefited from it, I highly encourage you guys to check out Fiqh of Love and register uh, on online. There's very little time left to do so and there's so much content to go through. So if you want Want to be able to benefit be one of those first few students where uh be able to ask questions in the live q a session the links are there again on in the in the chat and i see them pinned up here as well on screen please feel free to go and i'm sure we look forward to seeing you guys in the class there were some amazing questions submitted in this session. So as the Sheikh gets connected with the audio, we'll take some of those questions um, from you guys. We've saved some of them that were submitted earlier on in the live session. You're welcome to repost them in case you're worried uh, they may have been missed, inshallah. And the Sheikh is just rejoining so that he can answer some of those questions for you guys, inshallah ta'ala. Um, yes, as mentioned, it's 20 plus hours of content. I had some people who were asking, is this going to be relevant for someone who's divorced or who's widowed or who's uh, bitter about marriage? It's honestly it's meant to be thorough the reason why we have so much content it's about marriage a to z making the right decisions at every stage of that process um and there's a lot of focus a lot of content that's focused on how to build a healthy relationship how to have healthy expectations how to improve communication within with the marriage and the best thing i like about the Amagrib online classes especially classes with sheikh walid is the fact that the sheikh is so generous with his time when answering questions by far it's such a kind of beneficial experience just to be in the live Q&A sessions or just to be able to, to ask all the questions to your heart's content uh, with Sheikh Walid because he does not stop until everyone gets their answers. And uh, he is the only instructor uh, who is actively always engaging with his students in private Telegram groups with us. Uh, we always have Telegram groups and communities for every class that we have uh, for Maghreb Online, but Sheikh Walid actually joins a group, interacts with you there, answers questions after the class is over. So it's truly a lifetime benefit uh, to be able to join in a Maghreb Online course with him and especially on this topic because I'm sure challenges and things will come up in later stages of your life and you're going to want to have that. I see Sheikh has rejoined us. Let me see. Sheikh, can you hear us? Oh, no. No, I can't hear you. Oh, now you can, I guess. Alhamdulillah. We've okay. sorted it. All right. Jazakallah for rejoining. So, Sheikh, there were a lot of really amazing questions that were submitted. Of course, there are so many challenges that come with people, uh, you know, with around the topic of marriage. So I want to jump right into a few of them. People, you guys can, everyone in the chat can continue to keep submitting them on Facebook, on YouTube, and we'll take as many as we can. And the next 10 or so minutes, we'll take it down to the half hour. Let me point. first shout out for my uh, man, my boy, my, my man, Aqab Arshad from Houston, Texas. I love you too, man. Thank you for being on the chat and on the course. Awesome sauce. All right, Bismillah. So, Sheikh, are you ready? Are you ready for the question? Yes, I am ready. All righty, let's get started. So, Bismillah, I saw some great ones that were submitted that we saved a little earlier. So, one person was asking, "What about a couple when there is no communication? The husband only communicates through text, and they never he never talks about the main issues that is affecting the marriage." I will advise highly that communication makes it or break it you can, in any relationship. So what that means, we only text message, message each other. But I'll tell you, sometimes there is people are good at writing, not in talking. Okay. And some people are good in talking, not good in writing. So make sure that you see what methods that fits in communication better. So sometimes you, you can write what you want to your spouse. You know, sometimes writing can make you think a little bit more before you say what you're saying. But if there is a cut, you know, there's no connection between you and your spouse. In this case, I will recommend that you find a third party to make it happen. 
you know, where you just communicate like a, a mediator or a, a marriage counselor, right. you know. One of the things that you will see in this class, we talk about a lot marriage counseling. And one of the big mistake people, and I have a lot of marriage counselors, um, I, I invited to give their feedback. And one of, them, one of my partners in this course, Sister Sara Sultan, who's a licensed a therapist, and she do a lot of counseling. Um, one of the common things that everyone's saying, and uh, Dr. Ashpan as well, and, and others, um, they, they said, just don't wait until the last minute to work or to see a marriage counselor, you know? Um, and uh, don't wait until it's just a check mark, I did a marriage counseling. No, make sure that you invest in marriage counseling before things reach to the end, before one foot in, one foot out, okay? Um, and if there's something I learned as an imam dealing with all these things, if you think marriage counseling is expensive, and try a divorce. Fair enough, Sheikh. All right, the next question, and this is an important one because I feel like, Sheikh, a lot of people are getting very disillusioned, very jaded about marriage. Um, so the next question is, what do you say to people who say they give up on marriage? Give up on your marriage. No, on marriage or the, on the concept of marriage. Say a single person who just gives up on looking for someone. Okay. I mean, why? Yeah, there is... This is something I talk a lot about in the course as well. Marriage is good for you. Marriage is, is, is the way of life. It's a natural. It's a fitrah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam and he created for him immediately his partner, his spouse, zawj. Even when he was in Jannah. Can you imagine you have everything in Jannah you want, yet you still need a spouse. There's nobody stay single in Jannah. You know, you need the spouses is just you know, the other half of you, your soulmate. Marriage is something so beautiful. Somebody that, you know, you spend the rest of your life with. Somebody inspire you to grow. You know, marriage is, the Prophet said, this is my sunnah. And whoever leave my sunnah will be, but will be deviated. Allah said that he have not sent messenger or prophet before Muhammad وسلم, unless they have families and children. In general, Isa is an exception. But some scholars said even Isa, when he comes back down to earth later on, he will marry. And you have family. He said the Sunnah Allah and all yeah, and that if you don't get married for whatever reason, no, you tried, did it work out? I'm fine to understand. You give up in marriage because you're trying, you're trying, then it's not working. Some people never get married. It's pal no proposal or bad proposal. I'm not telling you, don't ever settle for somebody who's bad. But don't be too picky in your in your you know, any, uh, conditions and don't make it hard for yourself. So Allah make it hard for you. But have a standard. Don't don't go beyond that standard. I'm not gonna marry someone who, for example, from al bida from innovators or have a corrupt belief or someone for example is making major sins openly and stuff like that i'm not going to do that uh, uh, uh going back to uh, you, this is a time where people are so scared of failing marriages failing marriages problem problem you know what you hear a lot about problems of marriages because i'm failing marriages because this is by the way not the wrong not the norm, not the majority. Still the majority of people are married and having life, good life. Usually people express the, the moments of difficulties. They don't talk about moment of happiness. That's in nature. That's why in history you talk about wars and stuff like that. Big things happen. And famines. You don't read in history, talk about the details, good things that happen every day in everybody's life. Usually people don't talk about it. So that's why you're not exposed. But there's so much good out there in marriage, in relationship. There's a lot of people, subhanAllah, shape by this. Umar radiallahu anh said, those who are not married, imma ahir, imma fa'ajiz, imma fajr. Somebody, a'udhu billah, fulfill his desire in haram, or someone is sick, like have a problem. When he, he, he was asked about young man, why are you not married? So marriage is something important. and 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 you should value it because it's Sharia value. And it's so rewarding in Islam. Every single moment passed by while you're married, 
you are fulfilling an obligation on you. Allah reward you for that. So staying single is not a way to go. I understand you might want to wait until finish maybe education or something like that. I understand that. But just to cancel the idea itself is not right. That's not true that there's no good in it. Yes, there is hard to find a good man, hard to find a good woman. But there is a lot out there. And when you find them, make sure that you hold on to it. Yes. Uh, the next question was submitted earlier on the stream. Uh, it's partially a rant and partially a question. So someone was saying, Rasulullah was so happy with Khadija Radhanha. Why do people in society not, uh, why are they unable to accept marriage with age differences, especially if the wife is older? And anyways, how do you make a marriage successful when there is an age difference presence? You have to understand also that the Prophet Sallallahu culture is different than our culture. Lifestyle is different than our lifestyle. You have to take that in consideration. Okay, so certain culture, it might be difficult. Women are not the same like 100 years ago. I can tell you there's a big difference between my daughter who was 10 years old and my mom when she was 10 years old. And my, I don't have sisters, but like my cousin when they're 10 years old. You know, there's a big difference, you know, between generations. You know, that's why things are changed. So keep that in mind. So don't just be literal taking things like without context. Uh, that's number one. Number two, I think it is okay to marry someone who's older than you as long as you guys connect together. You know, uh, last, I give you one important fact to take in consideration. Uh, people who are uh, sociologists, okay, saying a uh, long time ago, it took about no, I mean, 50 years ago, something like that, it take 20 years to build a generation. It take what, 20 years to 25 years to move from one generation to another. In modern time, it takes five years to move from one generation to another. So if the age gap is so big, you feel that you guys from completely different generations. Like, you know, like all these like uh, people who born in 2010 and up, Okay, uh, uh, they are generation that might not be able to connect with 2000. 2000 and up, not connect to 90s. 90s will not connect with 80s and 70s will not connect with 80s. It just, it, it shift is so fast. Jokes and interest and, and references and languages change. You marry someone who born in the 70s and you tell them, sauce, okay, what kind of sauce do you like? How sauce, <laughs> okay, and you know, or, or you know, you, you talk like to people like with, with words that doesn't make any, you know, like, they cannot even click with you, and it jokes, references to things in, you know, TV or something like that, you, you just, or different generation, that's where the age gap comes. So um, I'm not against it, but just understand the nature and uh, and not everybody the same. It might be somebody older, but so hip and so into what's going on and like, you know, living in like his life and understand the, the culture and stuff like that. That's why, as long as you understand, I think, I think that the issue of marriage is a very personal thing. And I think that as long as you have what you want in a person, and that person, marry that person. And I know people married somebody who's much older than them, and they were the happiest ever. And people married someone of the same age, they were not happy, and so forth. Yeah. Sorry, Sheikh, I know you can be so much more thorough in these answers. I want to try to get as many questions as I can. But you're very right about this age gap thing. Uh, case in point, until recently, I was the youngest person in a Maghrib HQ. And they took every opportunity to remind me of that. And most of us are millennials. But millennial is like, you know, a good 20 years or difference. It's about a lot of millennials in, in their late 30s and millennials in their 20s are completely different. What's species. the new generation called now? You guys not millennial. What's the There's Gen Z, which is after millennial. Mm -hmm. 1996 or after and then there's one more gen x i know i don't know x was beforehand gen y we're just going down the alphabet i don't know wh wh which point we're at now oh uh, it's it's getting more gin style yeah 
stuff. Uh, the next question, I know Khaled is asking where to put them. The questions are being put in the chat. We're just going to take a couple more that were submitted earlier. I just want to remind everyone that there's going to be uh, five opportunities to have Q&A sessions, three of them with Sheikh Walid and two of them with Strasara Sultan, who is our co-instructor uh, in, the, in the class as alpha. well. Sorry? Somebody said Generation Alpha. Astaghfirullah, <laughs> may Allah protect us all. Um, so you will have plenty of opportunities to ask questions. This is a bit more of a casual, and we're trying to take a few questions here and there, but we want to do deep dives into all the topics that cover are covered in the class. There's going to be some really tough questions that come up as we go through some of the issues and the struggles that people have in finding people and having negative experiences and improving their relationships. So make sure you do register because that is where you're going to be able to submit your questions anonymously and get them answered by the Sheikh, inshallah. Um, we'll take a couple more inshallah sheikh before we close off just to be fair to those who submitted earlier inshallah and then we'll end the session um let me just quickly pull up my list again um the next question is actually sheikh you mentioned this earlier as well why has it become so difficult for muslim men and women to find a spouse nowadays and if you want to reference sheikh some of the stuff that you teach us in the class how do you do it correctly the hunt is the the, the the title of the lesson that you have on how to find and get to know a future spouse how do you do that correctly and what tools do you utilize for that uh yes in my class i have something called hunt and hunting grounds hunting methods you know uh, where people look for a spouse why it's difficult because um that fast change in culture okay uh, also life became very more materialistic and uh, a lot of people are, uh, there is something you can see clearly, younger people are, the, the level of maturity and responsibility, taking responsibility became less and less. There is um, one of the uh, few I know, he did a study uh, over 200 families. And he, ask the wives what's number one thing that you want in a husband or you you, you cherish the most in a husband and those women were in different age groups so i did like that study much but there's something caught in my eyes he said 90 percent of women regardless of the age group they said number one thing for them is a man who can be responsible can take responsibility and that's important Today, a lot of people just drop the ball, not willing to take the responsibility of marriage because they're spoiled, so many people, you know, they're not, they're not gonna stand when, because marriage is a challenge, it was tough days, you know, uh, and that's why it's so rewarding. And uh, I think that's one of the main reasons. Uh, and I talk about the rate of marriage and divorce and, you know, the complicity of marriage sometimes uh, can make things difficult for a lot of young men economically to get married, you know. Um, that's also another main reason for people it became difficult to get married. Um, there's so much artificial. Uh, we, in, in a generation, in the time, it became more virtual. And marriage is not, marriage is the most real thing, you know. But we're not used to people, we're not used to deal with people. We don't have that art. And that's one of the things that there is a long time, long term solution, you know, that we need to make sure that our community are ready for that, our youth are ready for that. We need to teach about that. We need to make sure that our community members and, and, and children are engaged in, in real relationship, understand what the value of wife is, you know, what, what women mean, what men mean, what it means to be a gentleman and a gentlewoman. A woman who respect her husband and a man who loves his wife and respect her and a woman who love her husband and respect him. You know, uh, uh, these things need to be revival. The Prophet as a role model in this area need to be addressed. Uh, I think more successful marriages put out there will encourage people to uh, go back into the marriage institute again. Yeah, there's there's more in the class about this. And Sister Sultan have a whole session about this as well. 
Awesome sauce. Sheikh, I want to keep asking questions, I think, and they won't stop coming in from the chat as well. But I think this is a good place, inshallah, to close. We'll have plenty of opportunity to uh, go in and poke your head out and and, and and make you have two, three, four hour live question, uh, Q&A sessions, inshallah, in this class itself. But Jazakallah khair for being with us today, for giving us those wonderful stories on the incredible marriages from Islamic history and, and teaching us those lessons to be learned from them. And of course, honoring us with this Q&A session. I can't wait to begin the class. Very excited, uh, inshallah. I see lots of people have been joining the Telegram group and registering while we're, we've been in the live session. Uh, we can't wait to connect with you guys in the private community for the fic of love. Jazakallah for being with us, Sheikh. Inshallah, we'll see you very soon. Any last words before we close off? No, yeah, but I saw Sister Soraya said she wished that she had uh, access to this information 30 years ago. And I want to tell you, it doesn't matter how old are you, how long it's been, as always, there's always a great future. Ibn Mas'ud said, if I only have one night, one day left in this life, I will not die as a single. And I'll say, if I have one day left in this life and in this marriage, I want to make sure that I spend that day and that night in the best marriage that can ever be exist. Mm -hmm. And that's really was my goal, to help you. And sometimes marriage cannot be saved, like what you heard from Obeisa have no problem with that. But I want to make sure that also when we ended, we ended correct. As much as this course talk about relationships, also lay out rules, guidance. And it comes from the one who knows us the best, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He knows you more than anyone else. And he, he set certain rules to guide us. And he left some area for us to explore and to work on it. And I said, there's a challenge in marriage, but there's a great reward as well. The harder things are, the more valuable. The harder you work for it, the more uh, you treasure it and you value it. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept from all of us. Thank you very much, and I'm looking forward for my next session, inshallah ta'ala. Yeah, there is talk about divorce. Somebody asked about divorce. There is a lot of talk about divorce as well on the rules of divorce and how can we have a civil divorce and all the rights. I think one of even the session that I will give is an extra session, talk about divorce and, and uh, you know, some of the financial things related to it and stuff like that. And, and the world of divorced women is another world that deserve a course by itself. But I said to myself, when I, mean, I talked to a mother, I said, fiqh of love, if we're going to teach divorce, what am I going to call it? Fiqh of uh, divorce? I'm not sure how many people register for that. But that's why we put it together, you know, because I think it's still, even with divorce, it means we still can keep that love. Divorce doesn't need to be nasty, you know. Um, and that's something I, I talk a lot about it. And I've said touching on that as well and talk about it as well uh, in the last session. You know, uh, for me, you know, when, when, thing, when I see divorced man, divorced woman, I don't think of their spouse as a bad person. I think it's just a bad matching. And I just leave it right there. Love you guys. You can go forever. So I go. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh Walid. Um, and that is that a wrap for today's webinar. Jazakallah khair for those of you who've been with us from the very beginning of today's session. May Allah reward you uh, immensely. And for those of you who've been active in the chat submitting questions, apologies if we didn't get a chance to answer those. Please do register for the class and continue to submit them there. Inshallah, we'll have a lot more opportunity for Q&A sessions and time with the Sheikh to poke his brain out and to ask as much as you want. And alhamdulillah, through the 100 lessons that we have in the class as well, many of those questions will be answered automatically. Once again, the URL is almagrib.online forward slash love. If you have any questions about what's being covered in the class, uh, what the topics are, please feel free to send us an email at online at almagrib.org or message us on the chat uh, set button that pops up on the screen there. And we look forward to seeing you on the other end. Uh, Jazakallah for joining us once again. This is Mr. Hafsa from Almagrib Institute. For now, take care, stay happy, stay healthy, stay safe. And assalamu